Hello, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. Um, I'm Larry Port. We're going to wait a second or two for everybody to come on in here. Um, and I would say this is that if you are like in your law firm right now, or if you, you know, send the link to your colleagues, definitely send the link to your colleagues, because um, this is like a team effort. I think it's really important for everybody at the firm. We'll talk about this, but it, you know, you're only as strong as your weakest link. Let's get started about cybersecurity. Uh, this is a big topic and we have a full hour. We got uh, an hour's worth of technology and um, general credits for you guys for the Florida bar. If you're not part of the Florida bar, can't really help you there. Um, but ask me questions. So I wrote the first version of Rocket Matter. Rocket Matter is this web-based software um, that uh, for, for lawyers to manage their practice and keep everything uh, nice and secure in the cloud. So I know this stuff more than most, I stay awake at night thinking about it. I, you know, this, so security is kind of my gig, uh, information security. So, but I, so I started Rocket Matter in 2007. I'm also a husband and a father. Um, I have two um, big stinky teenagers. Um, I have a dog and a cat. Um, I'm a writer. I love the outdoors and I love to read. So if you share any of those hobbies, drop me a line, you know, or if you have any questions about cybersecurity, drop me a line. Now, Rocket Matter is uh, started in 2007, and that's the uh, company that I started, and I actually built the first version of it. I'm not an attorney by training. I am a software engineer. I've now worked with thousands of lawyers, but uh, I am originally a software engineer. So I built Rocket Matter because some of my lawyer friends were complaining about their being able to automate their offices. And it, it, since then, you know, it's... Uh, it, it's combined my background with visual design. I was actually a film major with, you know, kind of my love to like kind of work with people and help them grow their businesses. So there's a lot of that baked inside of Rocket Matter, great customer service and so on and so forth. And it runs cross platform because, you know, I like to use Macs. I like to use PCs. I like to use iPhones. I like to use Androids. I love all those things. So uh, I wanted to make sure that everybody can use it wherever they wanted. And it's used by thousands of lawyers around the world. Now, um, because of all this and, and seeing how law firms operate and my experience having to build my own business, I teamed up with a lawyer in South Carolina and we wrote this book called The Lean Law Firm. And basically what we're doing is we're introducing management techniques from places like Toyota and others and government and all sorts of other areas where they're using these techniques and, and, and uh, spelled out how law firms can use these techniques. So we have a podcast that's free you can listen to. We've done close to 100 episodes at this point, we have uh, the ABA book, and we also have that on audiobook. It's cheaper on audiobook, by the way. And uh, let's get into the topic du jour, which is cybersecurity. So this I just read about right before, uh, uh, during my lunch break, actually. So I just, I just threw this slide in. So T-Mobile had a hack. Fun. Uh, I use T-Mobile. We don't use it anymore, but we used it a couple of years ago. So I think that... Um, it says there's 40 million former and prospective customers that applied for T-Mobile credit. So I don't know that this is me or not, but if you were, uh, if you had used T-Mobile at some point, there's a chance that you could have been breached today. So look up an article and it'll tell you what to do and, you know, how to see if you were affected by it. But, you know, every, the point is, is that every day we're hearing about breaches, right? And we're hearing about pretty serious thing. Now, most of you on this call aren't as vulnerable to a lot of these breaches because you run a small law firm. Doesn't mean you're not, you can't be breached, but uh, as we'll kind of discuss, a lot of times when people get in trouble is when they have like larger operations because it introduces some complexities in terms of information security that um, you don't have to deal with. Now, there might be people with like major firms, but you know, if you could give me a sense of, if there are firms here that are mostly small, you don't need to say anything like that, but if there's firms here or, or people working in an organization that have hundreds or thousands of people, you know, let me know, raise your hand and you can do it privately. So the whole using the chat widget, but we'll talk about that. And, and if there's anything that I say that is too techno geeky, let me know. And I'll try and like break up the issue and break it down a little bit more for everybody, because uh, I want to make sure that you have the opportunity to understand that you're talking, I'm, I'm a computer security person, this is live. So type in your questions and we can answer uh, whatever you have. Uh, the most important thing uh, to know, and this is why I put the link into the webinar and that link, by the way, is missing an H. So let me do that again. Um, there we go. That's better. 
So if you send that link to people, then they can uh, log on. Now, um, when I'm saying cybersecurity is a team effort, it really is because uh, you're only really as weak, uh, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And everybody needs to kind of know what's up because, you know, if, 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 if all but one person is um, on board and that one person doesn't know what they're doing, then you're in trouble, right? So that, that's where the leak could be. So everybody kind of has to know what's up and there, there's ways to get people trained. There's, there's ways to do all these kind of things. So um, it, it, it can't just be you, the person on the webinar today. This information has to be transmitted to the rest of the team. Um, so, and, and one person can really expose a weakness for a whole organization. There was a um, famous story in the news years ago uh, an employee from Morgan Stanley and their, I think their mergers and acquisitions division. So somebody who had access to really sensitive information sold a BlackBerry on eBay and they didn't wipe the BlackBerry first. So whoever bought the BlackBerry had access to all this information and all this data was, was released. So, you know, all it takes is one person to screw everything up. And to be honest, there are some sophisticated attacks and sophisticated hacks, but most of them are like depressingly human oriented, right? So this is a human issue we're dealing with more than anything. Okay. So we've, we've been hearing a lot about ransomware, right? So this was a big one. You may have heard about this one. This, this was the meat packing operation. This was back in June. Um, there was, uh, 1,500 businesses that were affected um, in July uh, by a cyber attack, right? Um, and then another, and then there's, this was an article in the Ohio State Bar Association that says that law firms are, you know, they are a target. You do have sensitive information. So, and when we, so one of our clients is a whistleblower firm. And you can imagine how many people want access to that data because this firm protects people that are trying to raise awareness about issues in governments or organizations or what have you. Um, so, you know, you could imagine like last year, uh, we didn't, this, this person was not represented by one, by one of our firms, but there was, if you remember, this led to the Trump impeachment stuff. There was a informant, a whistleblower in I think the State Department. So um, I was like, oh boy, I hope that guy's lawyer is not using rocket matter, but he could have easily been using rocket matter because then you have the whole brunt of like government sponsored people, like whether it's Ukraine or Russia trying to like access data, right? So, um, <clears throat> oh, by the way, somebody's uh, people are asking if we're all muted. And yes, you guys are all muted because it's a webinar format. So don't worry, you can make as much noise as possible. You can continue vacuuming the house if that's what you're doing. So um, there was a, also another major ransomware attack. I mean, you, you, ransomware has kind of been the story of the year. There was the one on the pipeline, right? That uh, which shot gas prices high and led sh to shortages in the Southeast. So you're starting to see these tax like kind of affect infrastructure and it's going to continue. And one of the things we'll talk about and, and, and why ransomware happens is because people are not keeping their systems up to date. And this is where you have an advantage, right? Because you're a smaller organization. It's in these larger organizations that have tons of computers where a lot of times you have problems. So ransomware is not new to this year. These, it was kind of funny because I did a presentation on cybersecurity back in 2017. And I've done some before that. I, I flew up to Pennsylvania once because there was a um, there was a hosting provider in Pennsylvania that got ransomware. And it took down a lot of firms that were hosting PC law and time matters and things like that. This was in central Pennsylvania. And that may have been in the 2016 timeframe, maybe, maybe five years ago, maybe longer. I, everything flies so past, I don't know anymore. So I went up to Pennsylvania and I gave a talk on cybersecurity there. Um, but ransomware has been around for a while. Um, and the big ones that in 2017 were Pecha and WannaCry, right? So really, um, you know, it's just more and more frequent. Um, and, and I guess the question is like, why is anybody bothering to do this in the first place? Like why, 
who is doing the ransomware stuff. So with ransomware, I think it's like pretty clear what the motivation is, right? It's monetary. So it's something that like most people understand the motivation behind money. Organized crime is a big business. This just happens to be digital organized crime. It's the real deal. Um, so there's other, uh, but the actors are, there, there's, um, this was called, uh, I think it was called Reville or something like that, who was the network that did the ransomware attacks over the summer. Um, there's other hacking networks that are anonymous. By the way, that, that one went dark, the one that was doing all the ransomwares this summer. Um, they just were, it's kind of a cloak and dagger kind of thing. All of a sudden, they just like completely disappeared and got shut down. Um, there's so anonymous is another group that does a lot of hacking. Um, usually they're more kind of dogmatic or politically oriented. Then you have uh, Russia and, and they're vigilantes, right? So they kind of choose who they think is deserving of, of, of this information. Then you have like Russia, Iran, and China are political adversaries here in the United States that do a lot of um, attacks on our networks. And then there's also, you know, just complete randoms on the dark web. And, and it's really easy to put together attacks these days. I mean, and there's services where there, there's like ransomware for hires where you could go and do this. And I'm saying randoms on the dark web. A lot of people don't even know what the dark web is. So let me talk about that. It's a real thing. And it's, it's, it's appropriate because it's like, like when you want to study how like, you know, comets may like crash into the earth and kill all of us. You kind of need to study the Oort cloud and where comets come from. This is the same thing. The dark web is where a lot of this information changes hands. So it's a real thing. You can't access it on your own with your own browser. You need to download a tool called Tor. I'm not going to demonstrate how to do that, but Tor was developed by our, uh, I don't know if it was DARPA or which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Association, but it was some sort of US government sponsored project and it was in use during the Arab Spring. So imagine that you're like, a political dissident and you're operating in an authoritarian regime and you need ways to kind of network with other people that are fighting the regime. That's what Tor was meant for. So it was meant for like these uprisings. So it's, it's this way of, of creating websites and making them super secure and, 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 how, and, and they're not accessible. They can't be searched by Google or anything like that. But now what happens is that people like on using Tor have created this whole network and the websites have these like dot onion domain names and so on and so forth. And then the Silk Road, which you may have heard at, uh, about, and it became a movie about this. It was, it was started by somebody who called himself the Dread Pirate Roberts, who's, you know, the, the same name as the character from The Princess Bride. But you could buy anything on this. You could buy like drugs, forgeries, whatever it is, and have it shipped to your house. And you pay with Bitcoin, right? Because that's untraceable. So, but the dark web is like this i mean it's untraceable it's it's it you you can there's all sorts of illegal like pornography on it um there's murder for hire on it there's all sorts of horrible things any kind of organized crime type activity you could think of happens here right so scary stuff but that's where this stuff is and one of the things that gets traded are vulnerabilities computer vulnerabilities so that when somebody discovers a way to break into a windows system you can exchange money for that, for that technology and use it yourself. So that's the dark web. It's a real thing. There's real bad guys out there. But again, everything comes back to your people, right? Your people are your number one risk. And that's why it's important to get everybody trained, everybody on the same page. So you can have everything completely buttoned up, but you have one guy, they come in and they take the whole thing down. Now, uh, you guys remember, may remember... Edward Snowden. So Edward Snowden, he is, um, he believed in access of information and he found some abuses that he believed that the government was doing. He was a contractor for the NSA, young guy. And what he ended up doing is downloading all this information from the NSA and releasing it. Okay. So he is now on the lam and I believe he's like living in Russia or something like that right now. So Edward Snowden, though, is like an example, because you could have everything buttoned up, but all it takes is one human element to kind of undo everything. So you, you really got to know where everything is. In, in, in software security, we talk a lot about something called surface area. 
and minimizing your surface area. What is the surface area of the attack and how do we minimize that? So conceptually, you kind of understand that like the fewer people that you have in your organization, the better off you actually are. So for you solo attorneys and two and three user accounts, as long as you do the right things, it's a lot easier for you to stay safe than it is for like larger organizations. Okay, um, let's go over a couple of the attacks and how you can defend yourself against them. Now, I'm here talking to myself and I'm like alone. I see you guys out there. Peter's been like um, mentioning stuff about his dog. Um, we got Andre in there, we got Russ. So Maria, William, interact with me, ask me questions you know, about this kind of stuff so that you're prepared. And we're gonna start, and, and to be honest, the, the techniques to keep you safe are pretty simple. They're not that complex. In fact, I don't even know how I'm going to fill a whole hour of CLE with like the things you need to do to keep safe because it's really, there's very few things you have to do in order to stay safe. So please ask questions so that we can last the full hour and everybody can get their um, rightly deserved uh, CLE credits. Okay, so a phishing attack happens when you get an email and um, it encourages you to click on a false link. Now, it might not just be an email, it could be a text message too. Uh, it may even be like a phone call or something. Um, so then what happens is, is that the, you get this email, it's saying there's something wrong with your account or, or some sort of thing like that. You know, click here to fix it um, and, and update things. Um, so here, let's, this, is an, this is an actual phishing account email. So one thing is, is that the logo looks real and it's something that you would trust. So it looks legit. This is a low resolution image. Uh, that's why it's a little pixelated. Uh, I got this from like some government like FTC website. Um, a non-personalized greeting. Hi, dear, dear X. If it doesn't have your name, that's a giveaway. There, there's ones that do have your name. We'll get to those next. But phishing is a very broad based attack. Very, very, uh, so throwing a lot at the wall to see what they can get. So a non-personalized greeting, a trusted logo, and then a link inside the email telling you to log into your account, right? So that is, so those three things will help you identify if it's a phishing email. So when you click on the link, you'll go to a website that looks real, right? Uh, but if you look in the address bar, the address, the URL gives it that away. This URL is from a Russian domain, .ru, right? Um, so this is not really from Netflix. In fact, if you go back to the email that I showed you, right, the update account now button, in your email program, if you hover over that, it'll show the link at the bottom of the screen, or it might even pop up where the cursor is. And if it's not the domain in question, it's not something you should go near at all, right? So, but if you do happen to click on a link in an email and you go to a web page, always check the URL before you proceed to see if you're about to surrender your login information. Now, um, so what do we do? In my opinion, I never click on a link in an email. So, I know that sounds a little bit extreme. I mean, the, the, one, the one exception to that is Calendly, or if, if it's something that I, does not require any kind of authentication, right? But if you have an email that's asking you to click on something and update account information, never do it, right? What you do is, and, and by the way, I mean, this is a Florida Bar webinar, and I don't know about you, but I keep getting communications from FPL in their phone calls saying that, I haven't paid my bill and my service is about to be cut off. So I have to call this number. So that's a, like a phone phishing attack. And I know that's not right because I do automatic payments to FPL, right? So anyhow, um, but if you do get an email that has a link in it, don't click on it. If it's one of those, if it's, if it's from a service that requires a login, I, I just type it into the address bar manually, right? The, the next thing to do is just make sure that you have good spam filters going on. And if you're using Office 365, not just like Outlook that you host yourself or not, you know, or, or on an exchange service, but if you're really using Office 365 or if you're using Gmail, 
then you have a pretty good spam filter already. Now you can layer that on with SaneBox. So SaneBox is more of a productivity tool, but what it does is it, it it's an email filtering service that really cuts your inbox down to like the people that you communicate with and puts everything, everybody else in these other folders. And it's amazing, amazingly effective at, at, at reducing your volume of crap email. So because it reduces the advertisements, it also reduces, it, it also prevents you from receiving email from like randoms that you shouldn't be looking at. So SaneBox is a good tool on top of whatever other spam filters you have. Two-factor authentication, which we're gonna talk about in a second. And the only other thing that I would say is that if you think you did fall for a phishing attack, reset your password. And if you have that password on other websites that you're reusing, I would change those as well. And if you have a sysadmin, you got to let them know that you fell for the phishing attack. No shame in it. I mean, one of the things about security is, is that you just have to assume that a breach may happen. So you got to kind of strategize about what your reaction to that breach is going to be. So there's, so as long as you, you don't want to do anything, you don't want to cover anything up. So if something does happen and you do fall the, for the phishing attack, just let people know. So, all right. Does anybody know? Just curious, does anybody know who this actor is or what this show is that I have this picture from? Because like, I just binge watched this show and I like loved it. So in any case, right now, there, there's, there's another thing that we need to talk about in terms of fishing, which is called spear fishing. So imagine like, you know, regular fishing, like at least commercial fishing, they go out with these huge nets and they catch all these fish. Spear fishing, right? You got the spear gun and you're going after one fish. So so what's the analogy all about? So somebody has done some research on you and they know who you are and they know who you work with. And so what they'll do is they'll target you with a very nefarious email um, that appears to come from somebody that you know and trust. Could be your boss, could be a coworker, could be something else. And it seems like it was really meant for you, right? It could have a link in it that they want you to click it could have a malicious attachment. Like they could have a, uh, a Word document in there and uh, they double click it. And all of a sudden you double click the, the attachment that you got. And all of a sudden you have a Trojan on your machine. You either have something, right? Um, like it could like track your keystrokes. There's, there's, there's a type of uh, Trojan, meaning a program that like a Trojan horse, a program that comes in welcomed onto your machine, but then does something bad. So uh, there's one that there's a Trojan that actually uh, will track your keystrokes and send them over to other places so it can like see all sorts of stuff. Oh, somebody, somebody got it right. Halt and catch fire. He was also an elf in Lord of the Rings. Yeah, this is the actor Lee Pace. So Julie, awesome. I'm going to send you a free code for my ebook. Well, uh, the audio book recording of the Lean Law Firm, which you are free to disregard. So, um, but in any case, um, so good job, Julie. Now, um, <clears throat> the thing is though, it's not the friendly colleague that you think, it's an imposter, right? So it's not goodly pace, it's like a bad guy, right? Who, and, and this actually happened to the defense contractor, Booz Allen Hamilton. So uh, Booz Allen is like one of these major defense contractors and they also do a lot about cybersecurity, but somebody, uh, uh, got lured in by a socially engineered phishing attack. So somebody did, it was, a, um, it was actually from China. So they did a bunch of research about this particular individual, who they reported to and, and who would be on the email chain. And they manufactured an email, sent it to them, and they were able to like break in that way. So um, that was a spear phishing attack. Now, you can protect yourself against spear phishing attacks. So, um, you know, Pay attention to, if you're not a visual person, this may be a little bit more challenging, but I'm a super visual person. Like I said before, I went to film school. I worked as a photographer for a while. And if you're familiar with Rocket Matter and our eBooks and our software, you'll know that like I'm a nut for things that look good. But the, if, you, if, if the email is not formatted in a typical format, it doesn't look like anything you've seen before from that sender, chances are it's not from that sender. So now, you know, this is one of those things where I'm saying like, okay, if you're a small law firm, you 
you have some more protection inherently, you're not protected in this instance because you have access to a lot of information that's very sensitive for a lot of people. And there, there are um, motivations for people to do a spear phishing attack against you. So, so be aware of any email that doesn't look like it is. Um, make sure that the email address and the name match the sender's actual name and email address. If you, can, if you can't see the email address, then because of the way your software is configured, then don't make the assumption that it came from that right person. Uh, use two-factor authentication. And we're going to talk about two-factor fa authentication. I mentioned that before and what it is. And definitely make sure that your email program has virus scanning software installed and up to date. Now, this is a little different than what I was talking about before when it was a general phishing attack, but you want to make sure that if an attachment comes in, that your email software inspects it for malware, right? That, that's of critical importance that, that your virus scanning software is up to date and that it is attached to your email and it will automatically scan all your attachments. So important things to keep in mind and know. Let's see. So we'll do, we'll cover two-factor authentication. And, but before I do, let me just check in with the uh, questions here and let's answer things. Oh, somebody did ask a question about two-factor authentication. Valerie said, how secure is two-factor authentication using text messages with numerical codes? Uh, it's actually very uh, secure. So, and it, it's a very good way of doing things. So. And, and here's how it works. So, so the way two factor, you've done this, you've all done this because you get the little text message on the phone with the numbers, and then you have to type it in to the website or whatever. Okay, so let me explain how this works and why it's effective. Uh, it's really interesting. Like uh, the people that are like super crazy, like the people that build this stuff and do all of the uh, security stuff are like usually like doing like math proofs and so on and so forth and, and so on. Um, but so like you can almost write logical proofs to prove out some of these things. So two-factor authentication, what happens is, is that you keep some sort of like mobile phone number that only you have access to, or somebody you trust has, has access to on file with the, um, with the website that you're logging into. So you log in, so you go and you log into, let's say your bank and you go to the website and you log in, you do your username and your password. Okay, first of all, if you're in the middle of a phishing attack and you went to the wrong bank website, that website is not gonna be able to text you on your phone. So, so two-factor authentication protects you against these phishing attacks because of an artificial website. Remember I showed that screen where I had the fake Netflix website? If you log into a fake Netflix website and it wants to two-factor you, you're not going to be able to do it because it's it, it it's not going to have your information, right? So by getting a two-factor prompt, you know you're dealing with uh, the real deal. The second way that it protects you is that it guarantees that whoever logged in, it, it, it gives you an extra lock on the door. So once you log in, it's going to send you a code and it's going to know that it's you because it you're using a device that um, only you have. So there's, there's also, um, there's riffs on two-factor authentication. One of the oldest things that I remember using was a dedicated device. And you may have had these before, if you worked at a, like a large law firm, like back in the early 2000s was an RSA key fob. And they were like these key fobs that had these numbers that would change all the time. And when you would log in, you would also have to log in with the code that appeared on your key fob. Google Authenticator and Microsoft Authenticator, they're, they're these little apps. Um, those also use a similar technology to that, that, that fob with the automatically changing numbers. But basically, uh, it's, it's a very good and safe way of logging in. So if you have the ability to use two-factor, and if you're a Rocket Matter customer, I encourage you to turn the two-factor on. I know that it's a pain in the butt to be authenticated all the time, but it's important, you know? So that's what two-factor authentication is, and um, that's how it keeps you safe. Okay, let me see. It looks like we have another thing. Okay, here's something I'd like you all to do right now. I'm not kidding. So. Don't update your software right now, or you'll be booted off the webinar because you're, you're going to have to like um, restart your computer. But 
check and see right now if your if your software is up to date. If you're using an Apple, click on the Apple in the upper left hand corner, go to System Preferences, and look for Software Update. It's there's a lot of little icons in there, but Software Update's one of them. And see if you know you're on the latest version of the software here. Watch this. Okay, so if I go up here, I'm assuming you're. Let me see. You're still seeing my screen. I'm hoping you're still seeing my screen. Um, <clears throat> if I go to Apple system preferences and down here where it says software update, it says checking for updates. This is remember I'm on a Mac. It says my Mac is up to date. Mac OS big Sur 11.5.2. So I actually kept my, um, computer. I updated it yesterday. So, and there's been, there's a lot of updates coming out right now. Um, because when there's usually an update, it, it's security related, usually. So, okay. And then if you're on a PC, go to start settings, update and security windows update, please take a second and see if you are uh, need to do an update. So if you do need a, to do perform an update tonight, tonight, not tomorrow, but tonight, plug your computer in and charge it and start the update, right? Also, you know, the same goes with any of your antivirus software, just that has to be continually up to date because remember we talked about the dark web, what happens is that when a vulnerability is found, it gets bought and sold on the dark web. So there's no excuse not to do this. Um, and as a matter of fact, they send these updates out for a reason and you don't have to pay for them. So the, the reason is that the vulnerabilities, the, either they've discovered the vulnerabilities. All right, Lynn, thank you. Uh, Lynn is up to date. She checked. Good. That's good. Um, so, so either Apple or Microsoft will find the, doc, uh, the document or will find the vulnerability or somebody else will find the vulnerability um, or the, you know, they'll be aware of it somehow. So what they'll do is they'll create the patch for it. And that's what those updates are. Now, when we, when we had those major ransomware attacks on these big infrastructure things, remember we talked about the, the pipeline attack that um, drove up gas prices in the Southeast uh, at the beginning of the summer? The reason that happened was because it was this huge network of PCs that was maintaining the pipeline and their software was out of date. And that happens a lot of times with networks like that where do you remember using Windows and like anytime you would update it, the drivers would break and like you wouldn't be able to print or something like that or use your sound card? Well, it's the same kind of thing. You have PCs running a pipeline and those PCs have drivers for the different components along the pipeline. And if they were to update a lot of the software on those PCs, they might break all those drivers and, and so on and so forth. So Regardless, what ends up happening is that you have like hundreds and hundreds of computers that are running outdated software that don't have security patches and they're just a sitting duck for these ransomware attacks. So, um, and then when you see large organizations in general held hostage to ransomware attacks like that meat processor, it means that they're not updating their software. So, so, you, so this is a gimme guys, this is like a free, card you there's no excuse not to keep your software updated um <clears throat> so this is something that microsoft said in 2017 when the wanna cry and the petcha ransomware attacks were happening and those were big deals it's so funny when i go through my cybersecurity presentations like i've done it a number of times and back in like 2016 and 2017 when i was doing that uh when i was talking about this the tax back then were the jennifer lawrence uh, picture leaks. It was the Sony Pictures hack with uh, with the Seth Rogen movie. The interview with the North Korea situation was released. The Sony attacks were really brutal because not only was all that co uh, confidential information breached, but then all the computers were formatted and deleted. So that was a particularly brutal attack. Okay. So, but this is a statement back then that Microsoft said, and it says, this attack, and they're talking about the WannaCry attack, demonstrates the degree to which cybersecurity has become a shared responsibility between tech companies and customers. The fact that so many computers remained vulnerable two months after the release of a patch illustrate this aspects. 
As cyber criminals become more sophisticated, there is simply no way for customers to protect themselves against threats in, unless they update their systems. Microsoft 2017. Given Mike, okay, so Valerie said, given Microsoft's legitimate concerns, shouldn't they continue to offer security updates with Windows XP, Vista, and older OS? No, they shouldn't. Because if they do that, then um, they're gonna have to like keep older systems going and, and devote resources to that those systems need to be retired, right? So if you're running XP, Vista, and, and older OSs, then you, you need to get rid of those and you need to upgrade to a newer thing because otherwise you're gonna have this company that is gonna have to solve for every possible contingency on every different possible version of their software ever created. And it's just an untenable thing and it's just not, it's not a good idea. So there's just no way they can do their job very well if they have the, all those old systems running. Uh, I appreciate the sentiment, though. It's like it seems like it would only be fair. But if you're still running XP, you're just setting yourself up for disaster. Okay, this should go kind of without saying, but um, password protect computers and phones. So if you don't have a password on your computer or if you don't have a password on your phone, make sure you set it up right away. Phones are lost all the time, and so are computers. So especially like laptops, I, I've read some sort of crazy statistic and I was like, that can't be right. But when I was doing a cybersecurity thing years ago, I read this thing that like in a six month period in Chicago, 20,000 uh, smart or 20,000 phones are left in taxis in Chicago in a six month period or something like that. It was just this like crazy phenomenal number. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if, if, at the very least, make sure that nobody can get into it, uh, aside from you or whoever you share your, you know, your, your family members or whatever it is. And I, by the way, I totally would recommend your family members know how to get into your devices in case something happens to you. Otherwise, they're just going to have to delete the things. So this should go without saying, make sure a password, um, make, make sure computers and, and phones are password protected. Um, now, so let's talk a little bit about this, though. Let's let's take a break for a second and talk about password policy. And let me see. There was one question that I thought I missed here. Somebody's asked for a password management uh, password manager software. We're going to get to that in a second. Great question. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, Peter said. My volume of incoming phone calls on my personal cell is dominated by various forms of spam, spam and scamming. Me too. I, I run RoboKiller, and I am sure many others use call screeners. So my call screener is I don't pick up unless I have the contact in my phone. What can we do as a firm to help ensure our legitimate contacts are not accidentally screened out, especially if we share an area code? That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head about what products like a lot, like our, our successful phone screening products, but I can look into that and get back to you on that. That sounds like it'd be a great blog post for the Rocket Matter blog. Okay, by the way, Laura, great job. Uh, uh, Shanine, great job on having your system up to date. Lynn, good, all right? Remember, check those systems, make sure they're up to date. Um, <clears throat> okay, let's switch gears a little bit. Now, let me um, guilt you all into changing your passwords. I, I feel bad about this stuff because I feel like I'm being like all judgy and this and that. And, but it's security. So it's like there's kind of no way around this. So the most common passwords in the United States, they usually flip-flop place uh, one and two are one, two, three, four, five, six, and password. And that's not good because that means they can be easily guessed. I guess that might go without saying, but it, it's worth bringing up like, why is why are those bad passwords? Well, they're bad passwords because people can guess them. Um, usually they share position one and two and they flip-flop each year. And I don't know where this data comes from. I have no idea, but uh, it's like some sort of security company is releasing this, but I don't know how they verify that, that this is the thing. So I have some tips for you because every website has uh, their different requirements. So here's what I do. The first thing I really do is I use a password manager. So, but we'll get to that in a second. But um, numbers that look like letters or, or symbols that look like letters are your total friend, right? You got the three for the E, you got the at sign for A, a dollar sign for S, a one for an I or lowercase L, a seven for a T, a two for a Z. Like, take advantage of these kind of things. And I'll, I'll show you how they can do that. And there's, 
Uh, you can also use, you know, whatever uh, letter, whatever numbers are also words. Like I go to the gym. Um, I'm waiting for you. I ate the sandwich. Like words, numbers that are also words or homonyms with words are good ones to also think about. Then combining words is another one. So, and definitely no pets or, or, um, oh, somebody put great idea and they used, uh, oh, very good, Lynn. She pasted it to everybody. But um, birthdays and pets, I can't tell you how many networks I've gone on where I don't even like know what the password is, where I type in somebody's pet and I type in one, two or one, two, three, and I get on their, their personal network. Um, so somebody, I'm, I'm sure there's people on the, on this call right now that have a Wi-Fi network that has a password that is the name of their dog or cat plus one, two, three on it. So I guarantee you now in practice, here's a couple of examples, um, pizza for free. Okay. So it has the one instead of the I and the four as the homonym for the word for plus it's got two capital letters and who's not excited about pizza. No one, everybody likes pizza. So there's an exclamation point. So that's our symbol. The next one, sites to see, right? So, and these are just examples. Please don't use these. But, you know, the number one instead of the I, um, and you, you have the dollar sign for the S. And then the last one is I ate the candy. I was going to use I ate the sandbox because there was this, but I didn't, I figured like nobody would know what that was. But we used to play this game when I was like four where, um, the lucky person says, I won the sandbox. And then the unlucky person said, and then the, the unlucky guy says, I to the sandbox. And you keep going back and forth until somebody says, I ate the sandbox. And you're like, oh, gross. So I ate the candy. And you can see, so, so these are good, these are good kind of uh, heuristics and, and, and things to remember when you're creating passwords. But the password tool is your friend. Um, this is one password. This is the one that I use. And this is one that I recommend. I know there's others on the market. I don't have any familiarity with them, but I've been using this one probably for 10 years or longer. So what's nice is that it stores the passwords in an encrypted manner. And you can do that with, uh, you, can, you, can, you can share it with organizations. So I have, uh, they, they, they organize them into, instead of folders, they organize your passwords into vaults which makes sense. It's kind of the security analogy. So at Rocket Matter, we have a uh, vault for the engineering team and it has passwords to servers and things like that. And, you know, some of the tools we use like Jira, which is like a ticket tracking tool for development. We have a marketing vault and that has like the passwords to like our social media accounts and so on and so forth. And then I have my own private vault that has access to my bank account information. Now, What's kind of cool is that if on some of these ones, like where it's like the company Twitter account and it's shared, you just update the password in the vault and you're good. The other nice thing that, and, and the whole team can use it, right? The other thing that it's good for is that if somebody, if you have to eliminate somebody from your, if you have to fire somebody. So if you have to fire somebody and you're worried about them having access to sensitive information and you're using a password tool, you're in good business because what you can do is the, you can, you know, the business owner or your IT staff or your office admin can administer one password and they can change their passwords. You know, they, they can delete the passwords from that person's thing because everybody's tied into the same company, one password account. So it's a very good way to secure your company uh, uh, against not just like your current employees that you, you know, and helping them remember their passwords, but but reducing that risk of when somebody leaves and then performing something kind of nasty. Okay, so we talked about good password policies. We talked about updating, updating your computers and why those are so important and you know how those will prevent ransomware. Um, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna use encryption wherever possible. And those of you that are still looking at the screen, if I haven't killed you by now with my droning on and on about security, um, are seeing a strawberry and a banana. And you're probably wondering what the hell does that have to do with encryption? Well, I'll tell you. So I wanna explain how You guys having trouble with audio? Oh wait, is the audio back? Somebody said that audio, okay, all right. 
All right. So where did I lose you? Okay. What was the last thing I said? Did you hear the part about the banana and the strawberry? Banana. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So a banana and the strawberry are perfect smoothie ingredients, right? So imagine you have this, I want to explain how encryption works using this, which is a little goofy, but bear with me. So imagine you have this magic blender and you make a smoothie out of the banana and the strawberry. All right. But then you want to ship it to your cousin in Indiana. So there's this big pipe you can pour the smoothie into. It goes all the way to your cousin in Indiana and they get the smoothie, but they want it to actually be a banana and the strawberry. So they have this magic blender that they can run it through that will transform it back. So the, so in this analogy, the banana gets scrambled, the banana and the strawberry gets scrambled, transmitted, and then reconstituted. And that's the same way that data works, right? Um, for a lawyer, let's say that you have, you know, this pleading. Encryption turns it into gobbledygook. This is your uh, pleading smoothie, if you will, right? Bunch of like hex code numbers and stuff down there. Gets transmitted over the internet, encrypted, and then reconstituted as a document on the other side. So it, it's, it's, it's like having a magic uh, unsmoothie blender. Um, now, that's what HTTPS, like secure browsing, allows you to do. So the way it works with like Rocket Matter, for example, is that when you're using a website, whether it's Rocket Matter or whether it's Amazon or your bank or whatever, and you're using that HTTPS symbol, it gets encrypted inside the browser. So even the stuff outside the browser in your own computer can't access that information. Don't worry about, somebody says, I don't know how to encrypt. You're using encryption without knowing what you're doing. If you're using secure websites, HTTPS, right? So if you're using Rocket Matter, if you're, if you're using your secure, um, you know, bank account information or anything like that, or Amazon or whatever it is, um, you're sending encrypted information back and forth. So it gets encrypted at the browser level, right? Then it goes down through your computer, out, out through Wi-Fi or whatever you're connected into, and it eventually makes it to the server on the other side. In this case, it makes it to our Rocket Matter servers, which are hosted by the Amazon Azure cloud, right? So once they make it to our servers, they get decrypted, right? So there we have our pleading again. It's reconstituted in a normal form. Sometimes we store it encrypted as well. That's called encryption at rest, right? So um, in fact, like almost all of our information is stored encrypted at rest. But the whole idea is that when you get it back, there's a key to transform it into something readable. Now, people say, well, what about if I'm on a public Wi-Fi, is that secure? Well, yes and no. If you are sending, if you're not using um, HTTPS, in other words, if you're, if you're at a website and there's no lock on, on the address bar, then you're not using a secure website. And that means if, Edwin Snow, if Edward Snowden is there, then he can use something called a packet sniffer and he, can, and he can intercept traffic. Now, if you're using Rocket Matter or you're on your bank software or you're using Amazon and you're using a secure web pay, website, then when Edward Snowden is at the airport with you and he's, he's on the same public Wi-Fi that you're on and he's sniffing the network, then he's only gonna see the encrypted gobbledygook smoothie. He's not gonna be able to get to the banana and the strawberry. He's not gonna be able to get to that pleading right? Your biggest risk when you're on a public Wi-Fi network is who's sitting next to you and who's looking at your screen. Uh, VPN works in a very similar way. So if you use VPN tools, basically, instead of just the browser sending encrypted information, uh, the VPN tool encrypts all traffic uh, but the, on, on the network that you're currently on. That's about all I have for security. I know that there is some, like, definitely ask me what questions you have. There's some questions in the Q&A widget. Um, so great program again, does CLE apply to Illinois? I am sorry, it does not. Um, we can't report to other, uh, bar associations guys. I apologize about that, but you know, we're busy running our business. This is a free service for Florida bar members. Um, so do your best to, um, make the submission yourself. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> Matthew asks a good question. Two-factor authentication is a must. However, what are your thoughts on the use of biometrics, fingers, retinal scans, et cetera? If those biometrics are hacked and wind up in the hands of hackers, what are the implications? Um, 
That's a good question. I always wonder that myself and not just like hackers, but would, you know, you know, what if, um, I mean, could it be misused somehow? And I, I go back and forth with that one. Ultimately, I'm not too worried about it. I, I feel comfortable with what Apple in particular does. Um, I've just done a lot of reading about, you know, their biometric stuff. I don't know that I, so I use the touch ID on my computer. Um, I also use uh, the face recognition software on my phone. And, but it took me like four years to get comfortable with that. I hope I don't regret it. I mean, I, I think that I would like to think that you're safe. I can't promise you that you're safe by using biometric stuff, but I don't think, um, you know, uh, I, I don't think you have to worry about that quite yet. Um, here's the CLE course code, guys. First of all, you get 50% off your first three months of Rocket Matter for attending this webinar. If you sign up, just when you talk to your account executive, make sure you mention that you're on the cybersecurity webinar and they'll hook you right up. Um, also, um, you get a, a, a promo for our Lex charge, uh, which is our payment processing. So you get a discount. It's 2.75% and 20 cents uh, per transaction for six months, which is great. And the course number is 5523. And you, so this is a good one. Uh, Florida Bar gave us one hour for, of technology in addition to one hour of general, uh, general CLE. So thank you people at um, you know, the Florida Bar office. Okay, so there's a couple of questions that came in here real quick um, that I do wanna answer. What is the risk of a password manager itself getting hacked? Um, I, that's not a big risk. I, I think the risk of a password manager itself getting hacked is is not um, as 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 big of a deal as keeping your passwords on pieces of paper or trying to memorize them and having to change them all the time. Somebody's Lynn said encryption is to digital information as Star Trek transporter is to physical objects. Yes, absolutely, you got it. Okay. Can hackers spoof the email address when they send an email? Absolutely, they can. It's not hard to do at all. So that's definitely something to uh, be aware of. How do you encrypt email? Does, automat does Outlook automatically encrypt? There are email encryption programs, but typically that they are a add-on to the email itself. Most people, that, that's one of the kind of ironies about lawyers and security is that you know, when they'll, they'll ask Rocket Matter all sorts of questions when they're, when they're signing up with us about how do they secure their personal information. Meanwhile, they, everybody's sending all this really sensitive information over email and email is not encrypted. So, and, and not only is it not encrypted, but it bounces back all, it bounces through all these servers on the way between senders and recipients. So there's copies of the emails all over the, uh, all over these servers, all over the internet. So, that's why like when you're sending attachments, for sure you wanna be using some sort of secure attachment mechanism, whether it, even if it's a link that people have to like click on and download. But again, like you're sending a link. So like I'm saying, okay, don't click on links and emails. Well, um, in that case, you need to call somebody. The, the one thing I didn't mention is that calling people and saying, hey, there's an email coming with a link in it. You see it, click it. That's also securing yourself. So, I mean, if you know that you're supposed to be receiving something from somebody and you get confirmation on it, then that's not such a big deal. Um, did I miss a mention of Kaseya? Uh, we didn't talk about Kaseya, but there's these things called, um, they're called supply chain attacks and I just didn't want to get into them. And, um, but there was the solar winds attack and the Kaseya attack were attacks that like kind of really affected like larger institutional uh, clients because um, the attacks went against the security services that those institutions were using. So it's a little bit complex, but it's definitely interesting if you do that kind of stuff. Okay. I think we're good. Um, if you have any additional questions for me, I'm a nice guy. You can always um, email me, larry.port at rocketmatter.com. Always happy to engage with people. I look forward to hearing from you. And thank you so much to um to all of you guys for being here all right thank you so much